Thank you for being here tonight for the Brampton Mastermind event of March. We're so excited to have you and we're so excited to talk to Kalpnam. We like to begin every event with a conversation and just with a flashback of why Brampton Mastermind exists. And at this point, I would like to tell you a little bit of a story. Uh, last year, I came back to the country after working abroad for some time. And I came back to Brampton and it was my first time being in the city after about 10 years. I'd been gone for so long and I felt so alone when I came back. I had a couple different ideas for businesses that I wanted to run and I was so excited about it. And I had no community to back on. I didn't know how to begin, where to begin, who to talk to, who could be my first customer, who could be my partner, who could fund me. I had so many questions and not very many answers. It was very scary and also a moment of realization that we need community, we need people. As an entrepreneur, it's very, very hard to survive if you're all by yourself. And I have a feeling that many people in this room get that. That is actually also how Brampton Mastermind began. It began with Cliff, who is the founder, realizing that in his entrepreneurship journey, he felt really alone. People didn't understand his dreams and his goals and his vision of the things he wanted to do. And he needed to find somebody to talk to, somebody who got what he was going through, somebody who was also going through a similar experience because entrepreneurship is full of challenges. So last year, I came into Brampton Mastermind and I attended my very first event where Mohammed Faki was speaking. I was blown away blown away with the support system that existed here, um, particularly with the mastermind concept where entrepreneurs come together, support each other, answer questions for each other, help solve problems that by myself, I know I couldn't have solved. And today, I am so excited to share with you a story that, that brings forward exactly the kind of courage that it takes to start your own business exactly the kind of inspiration that you set when you really go out and you live your dream. Here we go. Kalpana, thank you very much for being here. Oh, thank you for having me. Thank you so much for joining us. We are so excited to have you here and we can't wait to dig into the story of your, your journey as an entrepreneur and of Unstick. Uh, so I like to think of our speakers as superheroes and I like to begin every interview with the same question. Just like Spider-Man had his origin story, every superhero has their origin story. What would you say is yours? So first of all, I just want to say to be an entrepreneur, you kind of need to be a superhero. So everyone here today I consider a superhero. Um, and to talk about my origin story, I kind of need to go back to when I was a child so you kind of see the, the pattern there. So I knew that I wanted to be an entrepreneur when I was 16 years old. And the reason I, I felt that so strongly was I used to be a real sports fanatic, uh, specifically with the NBA. And I used, to, I used to subscribe to Sports Illustrated magazine. And there was a 16 to 20 page article on Phil Knight. For those of you that don't know who Phil Knight is, he's the founder of Nike. And I remember reading that as a kid, like not a kid, but 16 year old teenager, thinking, wow, like I was completely blown away by his story and just, you know, what he, you know, what he did to get to where he was and everything. And I knew, I said, one day I'm going to be him. Well, not him literally, but one day I'm going to be like him and, you know, um, really have this, this product and this brand. And so I kind of knew when I was younger. And then fast forward to my university days. I graduated university. It was a spring and uh, beautiful weather. It was one of those summers where we had really hot weather in April. And I, I just didn't want to look for a job right away. And despite my East Indian parents' the background, um, who were adamant that I look for something right away, I decided to do my own thing. I said, no, I don't want to work in a retail store right now. I don't want to um, look for a professional job. I want to be outdoors. So I decided to start my own business. And what I started was a golf company. I knew absolutely nothing about the sport. I knew nothing about golfing whatsoever, never spent a, you know, a day on a golf course at all. And I started this golfing business because I knew I could be outdoors, you know, just you know, enjoying the great weather. So I decided to um, start this hole-in-one contest. And I approached um, all these different golf courses, literally went door knocking, like cold calling to all these golf pros and uh, with this idea that I had. And they all thought it was fantastic because what I did was I partnered up with a local charity 
And um, I sold these hole-in-one tickets at these corporate golf tournaments. And uh, I made $50,000 that summer being like a, a, you know, like a 21-year-old kid. And so yeah. what I didn't know about golfing, because I never golfed a day in my life, was that um, when you're on the golf course, you meet tons of people that are VPs, presidents, and CEOs. So I used to always get offered these different jobs all the time, nothing that I was interested in. And one day, um, the VP of Kraft Foods was there. Mm -hmm. And I had no clue who he was. We were just chatting. And he says, you know what? I think you'd be great for sales or marketing. And I said, actually, I just graduated. And my background is marketing. And, and you know, so hands me his business card. And he says, call me. And he was a VP at Kraft Foods. So he recruited me from the golf course. And I spent uh, the next six years in corporate marketing at Kraft Foods. And then from there, um, Pepsi uh, recruited me. So I spent about seven years at Pepsi in marketing and um, in the innovation department. I headed that department up. Um, along with uh, the Diet Pepsi brand, which I'm sure you're all pretty familiar with. And then from there, I was recruited from, um, by a company called Pizza Hut. And I spent about a year there, and then I decided to leave and uh, stay at home. I had twin girls, and I decided to stay home for a few years. And then once my kids were in school, um, I've always been an entrepreneur at heart, so I knew that I was going to take my corporate learnings one day and put them towards my own brand. And uh, here we are today. Wow. That is, that is quite a story. Oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I, that really deserved that round of applause. Oh, that thank you. Incredible. <laughs> 21, zero, 21 years old. Yeah. That's yeah. amazing. I just knew. I yeah. think you just know when you're an entrepreneur, you kind of have that gut feeling that kind of tells you. And I, I wanted to take my corporate learnings and put them into my own brand. I, I always knew that. I always knew that. Amazing. OK. So six years at? Craft, Craft foods, yep. and then another six, seven years at Pepsi, at Pepsi, and then a year at Pizza Hut. Wow, wow. Okay, so what got you? What got you thinking again about about entrepreneurship after all those years of being in corporate? So, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no worries. Did mean to cut you off. Um, and what encouraged you to get started with Unstick? So I decided when I was in corporate. Um, I've always been one of those people that's carried an idea book with me. So my husband would laugh because literally two o'clock in the morning I have this idea book beside my bed and I think of an idea and write it down and then you know go back to sleep. And even when I was in marketing, I have ideas for the brand, ideas for my own business. And when I was in corporate, I always thought that you know I really wanted to have my own business one day. Um, and I had all these ideas, but I had no time to pursue them because you're working these crazy hours every week and there's just no time. And so I kind of got sick and tired of like having my ideas and then seeing someone else have the exact same idea and making money off it. Like there was this one brilliant idea that I thought I had um, when I had the twins, so they were newborns, and I thought of this idea where, you know, it's kind of like a, you know how when you, have, when you have moms that are out here, when you have a baby and you take your baby out of the bath and you're, you know, you put them up here and they get all wet, right? So I had this idea, almost like a giant size apron, sort of a bib made with this towel, like terry material, except it would snap up, you'd put your baby inside, you could take it off and put your baby on the bed without the baby getting cold or anything. And I thought it was brilliant. I had a prototype made and everything. And then I went to this baby show. And of course, another mom had thought of the same idea. And she's making tons of money. So I decided this is it. I want to do my own thing. And that's what I decided to do. OK, interesting. So that's a fantastic answer. And I want to go specifically into the moment that triggered Unstick for you. OK, so I actually discovered Unstick by fluke. Um, I was overseas on vacation with actually my niece, who's here today in China. And um, as she knows, I'm a bit of a shopaholic. So she was at the hotel relaxing, and I decided to just go shopping all day. And I decided to finally stop and grab a bite to eat. And if you've never been to Asia or anywhere in China, um, there's about 200 food stalls. And you can just go from vendor to vendor, you know, choosing whatever you want to eat. And they make it fresh in front of you. It's not like here where they have the hot dog stands or anything like that. Um, it's all fresh food. So I was walking by to see what I wanted to eat. And I saw this lady, this older lady, and she had this little barbecue. And um, I just was drawn to her because I, you know, just I like to support older people, first of all. I just was really drawn to her. But she was cooking these chicken skewers on what looked like a little piece of material like this. And um, one of my passions is cooking. I, I make every single meal from scratch in my home. And I literally stopped dead in my tracks because I couldn't understand how nothing was sticking to this material, first of all, and how it wasn't catching on fire. I was just completely blown away. So I kept pointing to figure out what this material was, but because of the language barrier, you know, I ended up leaving the country not knowing what this was. And I came home, and seriously, I couldn't sleep at all. I said to my husband, I've got to figure out what this material is. Yeah. I couldn't figure out what it was. It took me a while to develop it and, you know, sorry, figure out the material and then actually develop it. But um, I knew right there and then of all my ideas I had in my idea book, I realized that none of them came to fruition for a reason because that was the product that I was meant to launch. 
look how that turns out. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was honestly amazing. I just, for anyone that knows, uh, like anyone that cooks and cooks on a barbecue, you know that fish sticks, every single thing, vegetables, everything sticks to your grill. So when I saw this, I actually came back to Canada. I checked every single store from Walmart to Williams Sonoma to see if anybody had a product similar. And every single person said no, and they all said to me, they said, oh my gosh, what a great idea, though. Like, they all thought it was a brilliant idea as well. And I said to my husband, okay, let's not tell anybody because it's going to be our little secret, you know. <laughs> and then we don't want it to, to spread out there, but uh, that's, how it, that's how it launched, actually. It was kind of a fluke that I, I fell upon it. Yeah, that is so interesting. It's, it's amazing how every entrepreneur's journey is always about seeing that there's a problem that exists and then exactly. somehow coming up with a solution for it. Yep. And that's exactly what you did, a problem that exists in every single household. And there you are now, there's a solution for it. Exactly, because for me, like I mentioned, I love to cook, but anyone that knows me knows I hate doing dishes. And um, my husband magically disappears when it's time to do the dishes. So for me, this was the br a brilliant product in my mind. <laughs> So is that what made you jump in with both feet? It was, yeah. I just, it was in my, my gut feeling just told me this is it. Okay. And it was perfect Excellent. timing too because my kids were starting to go to um, uh, start JK as well. So I started doing it before they went off to school. The timing couldn't have been more mm -hmm. perfect. Everything was kind of you know, perfect for me at the time. Yeah. Yeah, that's fair. Okay. Uh, so you were seeing that there was already kind of traction for it. People were interested in the idea of, of such a product. Um, but what were the initial years like? Did you experience any rejection, um, yes. any lows? And if so, how did you deal with them? The initial years, um, I think as any entrepreneurs, are always the, are always the toughest. Um, the hardest part for me, I would say, would be not having a budget at all. I had like literally zero dollars. Um, there was no awareness, so every time I'd go in and talk to a customer about it, they didn't know who I was. I had no credibility behind my name or anything like that, aside from my corporate experience, but it wasn't like a famous brand or anything like that. So, so definitely challenging. Um, rejection, yes, um, as all entrepreneurs know as well. And if you don't know this, um, you will get rejected. You'll go through rejection after rejection after rejection after rejection, but you have to persevere and get to that point where someone finally says yes. You know, so for me, there was lots of rejection for sure. But you just, you have to just pull up the pieces and, and move on and just, you know, stay positive and, and keep going forward. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how would you, how do you know that it's okay to keep moving on even despite the rejection? Well, in my case, I knew I had a great product. Um, and I think everyone thinks they have a great product, but I tested my product and I tested it with family, with friends, with friends of friends. Um, and where I think I knew that it was going to be successful was my very first trade show. So we were at this, um, it, back then it was called the um, Delicious Food Show, I believe it was. And we just had a 10 by 10 booth. And um, there was my husband who took the day off work to, to, to be there with me. He didn't want to be, but he did. Um, so it was a Friday, Saturday, Sunday we were working. And the Friday it was just the two of us. And I thought, oh, you know what, two of us will be more than enough. I can walk around, network while he's at the booth, you know, and, uh, you know, selling my products and stuff. And we had a demo going. And we literally, as soon as the doors opened, people started coming by the booth. And we had a corner booth. We literally had crowds and crowds and crowds of people. We couldn't even take a bathroom break. It was just insane. And the next day, the same thing. It was a Saturday. Um, my sister-in-law was there. And same thing. We, we had to have like six people on in this 10 by 10 space to the point where the organizer of the show came up to me and said, I've never seen people flock like this for a product. And, and she, they had to, have to create a line down the aisle because it was blocking all the traffic and stuff. But mm -hmm. It just blew me away, and it was almost—it was very emotional for me too. I felt like crying because this is like this is a hit. People actually like this product because you don't know how it's going to turn out when you go to these shows. You're just—I was very nervous, thinking it's a big show. It's you know in the, at the um, Direct Energy Center, and I was very scared, thinking I hope people buy this product, and you know, and it was just—it blew me away. It was really nice, and it's nice because we do the National Women's Show every year as well. And every year that we're there, we have repeat customers that come and bring their friends or, you know, they've, they've had their product for years now and they want a new one. So it's, it's really nice to see that, the repeat customers as well. Okay. Yeah, interesting. So it sounds like there's three things that I think you mentioned specifically. One was market validation, first with family Definitely, and friends yeah. of family, um, then with trade shows um, and the women's show. And the third thing that you mentioned for sure, which I think sticks out to everybody at any given point, is grit holding on despite yeah, the rejection. Yeah, yeah. yeah. incredible. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to kind of come back around to the corporate background that you had in marketing. How do you think that supported you or helped you with your goals with Unstick? You know, I was very fortunate enough to spend um, almost 15 years in corporate and I found that the learnings that I had, like being in charge of an innovation department, first of all, which was all about new product launches. 
So in innovation, when I worked at Pepsi, I was always come up with all those products that you saw out there, Pepsi Lime, Pepsi Blue, Pepsi Vanilla, that was all me. So if you didn't like them, I apologize, <laughs> but that was all my, pro the mini cans, that was my launch as well, the small little mini cans. But um, so I, it really, really served me well for this product because from day one, I knew how to launch a product. I knew about packaging, I knew about you know operations side. The only thing I didn't know, which I learned very quickly, was um, the importing side. Like, how do I produce it in China and connect with people in China and you know trust people overseas and bring it over here? That was the, the part that was missing for me. But I, I think I picked it up pretty quickly. Um, you know, I think that when you're determined to do something, you just find a way to do it. And and I was fortunate enough that my connections that I had in my my networking group, um, they were really helpful as well. So that was a big played a big role in my life as well. Okay, amazing. Um, at this point, I would like to open up the questions to the audience, and um, if you've got thoughts brimming, you have any questions, please raise your hand, and we have a mic going around. We have a mic. Oh, coming sorry, the for mic's you. coming. You just speak right into the. Just speak right into buttons. it. I think. Kalpana and you as well, I'm here for the first time um, after a long time. Um, so some of, I am an entrepreneur who um, sells handcrafted leather oh, beautiful. products. Um, and they are artisan handcrafted, although designed, some of them are designed by me. Um, they are ha handcrafted in different parts of India. Um, I am actually a computer engineer, so this is something that wow. I do as a passion. <laughs> wow, good for uh, you. So without a marketing background and being an entrepreneur, I'm, you know, it's a hard, you know, because we don't understand everything that goes be behind scenes for from um, inception of an idea to when it's brought to the market. So how do you recommend that I fill that gap? That's a great question. Um, I would say there's leverage your resources. So for example, in, in um, Brampton, I know there's obviously masterminds. There's also the Brampton, I believe it's the Entre Entrepreneur Center, and they have lots of great lunch and learns where they have speakers that come in and they talk about um, everything from finance to new product development to you know, like basically every facet of being an entrepreneur. Um, the other thing I would recommend is getting a mentor. Like I mentor a lot of students. Um, actually, one of my uh, students, not a student anymore, but a very successful is, is here today. Um, you know, so I would get a mentor as well because sometimes I find being an entrepreneur, especially in your case where you're working full time as well, you can sometimes feel very isolated. So it's important to, to have that network of, of friends and um, other people that are entrepreneurs as well and your support system at home is really great as well. But um, it's, and also follow people that are in a very similar industry on Instagram, on Facebook, see what they're doing and learn from other people's mistakes, learn from other people's wins as well. I always encourage people to learn from others as best as they can. Like, don't reinvent the wheel. If someone's doing something similar, not exactly the same, but similar, um, and that you think they're doing a great job of advertising it or marketing it, you know, definitely take that model and just apply it to your own. Like, for example, right now when I see that, first of all, it's beautiful. Um, right away, the first thing I think of is, you know, to really, really highlight that point of it's handcrafted, it's a unique, one-of-a-kind piece. Because people like that. They want something that's more personal, that's one of a kind that no one else has. So that's something I would definitely, you know, I don't know if you have Instagram or any social media right now, but if you don't, I would start that right away and start getting a following. Okay. Um, to the following point, what, ha what have some of the... Um, Could you take the mic so everybody oh, can hear you, sorry. please? Um, Thank you. What are some of the recommendations for, you know, I, I'm, I'm having my website ready in sp the spring. Uh, but for people to follow, do you have some recommendations? Definitely. Um, contests are a big thing, really big thing. So I have a friend of mine that just started a business, and um, I'm going to give her a shout out. It's called For Foodie's Sake. Um, so if you're a foodie, it's an awesome business. It's a culinary food tours. So recently, um, she's going through the same thing, she's, and she's a chef. She's got this amazing chef background, and she's trying to figure out, you know, how does she get her, increase her following? So I said, let's run a contest together. So we just finished the contest. I was just telling you about this yesterday, yeah. actually, or today, actually. We just finished the contest yesterday, and it was just a three-day contest, or three or four days. And um, in three days, she, I think her followers increased by 337%. The engagement was 37% on Facebook. Um, and to put it in perspective, um, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Facebook engagement scores or anything like that, but. The average score is 0.9% engagement. So that means that 0.9% of the population that's you know, viewing you 
is engaged in your post or your contest or whatever you're doing. Um, one to two percent is what they consider to be good. And so we had 37 percent. And we leveraged my social media to go to her. So we directed my social media, like we said, okay, you know, in order to enter this contest, you have to follow her on Facebook, like her, her um, on Facebook and Instagram, and it was great. And there's been a lot of research with contests as well. It doesn't have to be anything big, it could just be something small, you know, and people love it. And they'll start sharing it, but you have to make sure that you mention that, like in order for them to enter, they have to share your post. And then you start widening, you know, the followers and broadening that. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. I think the, the, the point of collaboration is such an important mm -hmm. one. Um, and often people tend to underestimate what collaboration can do for you. People are pretty, very shy about collaborating with another entrepreneur who has social media following out of competition. But what they don't realize is that you can actually leverage each other's presence. Exactly. And so there are so many people in this room who might be having somewhat similar experiences but have access to different um, markets and different followers on their social media. Exactly. And if you just leverage each other, you could be growing together. The other thing, too, I always recommend um, for anybody and for yourself especially is if you can, if you feel comfortable doing this, reach out to bloggers like fashion bloggers, people that, you know, fashion, like accessory bloggers, um, influencers, they're huge. And you don't have to, um, you know, contact people that have a huge following because those ones charge an arm and leg for post. I mean, but for what we do is, um, because we still don't have huge budgets to do that either. So what we do is we reach out to food bloggers all the time and exchange, we give them free product for posts. And we typically target people that have 10,000 or less following because the ones that have 100,000, 200,000, they're gonna charge you $5,000 for a post. So if you do that and then they'll post for you, you know, in exchange, maybe give them one of your purses, like a smaller one or something. And uh, that's a really great way to drive your, to increase your following as well. Other questions? Jerry Ritz. Thank you. I really love this product. I used oh, all last you. summer, so I'm looking forward to this summer again. Uh, my question for you is, uh, at uh, you know, running a business, you are doing multiple jobs. At one point, you like, uh, did you realize, like, you, you know, which area you need to focus on? Uh, like, what is your role in a business today? That's a great question as well. Um, so as an entrepreneur, everybody can attest to this as well. You're wearing a different hat every day. So when I first started, it was just me. I was doing, you know, the marketing. I was the accountant the next day, the operations person the next day. I was the finance person the next day. So you're just, you're doing, you're wearing a different hat every single day. And my background, so my expertise is marketing and advertising and strategy. I love strategy, planning, you know, like thinking things through, making all the plans to sell this product. And I do have a sales background, a bit of a sales background as well, so I like sales as well. Um, so what I did was I did everything initially, and then I got to the stage where I realized that I can actually afford to hire people. Uh, that, this is one thing I love about being an entrepreneur too, is you can build your own team. You have flexibility to choose who you want to have on your team. So I was able to get um, you know, sales reps in the state, sales reps here, have an accountant, have a finance person. You know? So you just slowly build that out, but you can't do that until you get to that stage where you're actually earning some money to be able to hire people. But initially, unfortunately, it's just doing everything yourself and, and focusing on what you're great at. And also, if there's something, for example, if you don't know anything about finance, then get, you know, you, there's a lot of tools online that you could read as well with regards to basic finance for businesses. The thing with the internet now is there's just so much information out there. And again, back to the Brampton um, Entrepreneur Center, like I said, they have lunch and learns on topics specific to that. So, you know, I would definitely take advantage of those, those areas as well. Um, my question is um, kind of surrounds hobby versus a business. How does someone know if their hobby actually has business potential and what kind of steps should someone take if they want to take their hobby to a business? To the next level? Yeah. Um, I think that for me it's always a gut feeling and it's also what people are telling you. So in your case, because I know you, I know what your hobby is and I've been telling you this for years, you take it to the next level because you're very good at it. Um, <laughs> She is a pro with a glue gun and she does all these amazing DIY projects and she's so great on camera. Um, I've been telling her for years to do this and she's finally taking that step, you know, starting off. But uh, I think that, you know, it's, it's really, if you ask your friends and family, most, most, most people have a good support system. And I would like to think that friends and family would be honest with you. You know, like in my case, when I launched my product, um, before it was in packaging, just the, the raw materials, 
Um, I took it to my family, my close friends, and made sure that they didn't tell anybody, but I said, give me your honest opinion. It's not going to hurt my feelings. The only way to make this better is for you to give me your feedback and tell me what you truly think about this product. Would you, would you use this product? And, you know, because I knew, I knew I loved it, but I wanted to make sure that other people thought the same thing. It's not just me. It's everybody out there, and they loved it. So the same thing, just ask friends and family, you know, what they think of this idea. Would they purchase this if you, if you brought this to life? And I, I guarantee you they'll all say yes, because I've seen your stuff. Thank you for being here. Um, I, I think I read online that you were on Dragon's Den as well. Yes, I was. I, w I was curious if you could um, tell us about your experience there, uh, what sure. it was like behind the scenes and how that works. It was an amazing experience, um, both from a personal development standpoint and also just from a sheer business perspective. So obviously from a personal standpoint, um, just to be able to present to these, these multi-millionaire you know, entrepreneurs. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Just to be able to, to present to these, these you know, these business, sorry. <laughs> to be able to present to these, these amazing business people and get their feedback. In my case, we got three offers, so I was very, very pleased to do that. So from that side, it was amazing to be able to present to them. And obviously, I was very nervous um, leading up to that point. Um, and then from a business perspective, I mean, the sales went through the roof as soon as we launched on air. And uh, for that, probably for that month or two months, and now we still get, because when you're on TV like that, we were on Marilyn Dennis as well, and when we were on Marilyn Dennis, um, we did a, a demo, and it, actually Kevin O'Leary was on there at the time. It was, I was presenting to a panel of business experts, and he happened to be one of them. And on national television, I'll never forget this, on national television, and sorry, everybody knows who Kevin O'Leary is here, right? Okay. So you know how mean he is? So on national television, he said to me, this is a product that every home in America and Canada needs. So, I mean, when he said that, I didn't hear anything else. That's all I heard after that. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, it was, it was just an amazing experience overall. <laughs> if I can ask another question. If you, um, if you had a, a concept for a business and you don't have a team yet created, um, do you have any recommendations on how you could um, find uh, team members, like people interested in, like, uh, launching a business with you, like say it was um, uh, say a particular uh, restaurant that you hope to be a chain? So I can barely hear it's, Oh, so a uh, particular, like a restaurant, a specialty restaurant uh, that you would hope to uh, franchise. So it's like a big uh, concept and like looking for people who'd be interested in building that. Uh, oh, okay, so, so basically, um, so you have a concept, but um, now let me ask this, do you want to develop, develop that into your own franchise or do you want to sell it to somebody else? Is it an idea you want to sell or a concept you actually want to grow into a business? I, I would think I'd want to keep it and grow it, yeah. Then what I would do is, do you have a restaurant background at all? No, I don't. No? Okay. <laughs> so then I, then I would try and find someone, um, whether it's through your own network or you know, extended network, um, that has that background in restaurant because I can tell you right now I have a lot of friends in that industry and it's not an easy industry to break through unless you've got the restaurant background. So you definitely have to partner with somebody that's got that background and I guarantee you if it's a really great concept they'll be on board. Great. Okay, thank you. And But make sure when you talk to them you have like a sort of a not necessarily um, a full business plan in place but you know make sure you think, think, think it all through and have it all kind of like your strategy in place kind of form a broad perspective on what you're looking to do to, to you know to what your ultimate goal is with it. Yeah, yeah, Have some definitely. details and tactics kind of nailed out because if you're if you're talking to and this goes for anybody if you're talking to a prospective um, partner or potentially a buyer that's interested in buying your business, um, you want to make sure that you're not wasting their time, yeah. and you want to make sure that when they're there that they're going to be able to help you somehow. So the only way they can help you is if you have thought everything through. Because I can guarantee you, if someone came to me and said they want me to invest in something. I'd want to make sure they've thought their business through, you know, from start to finish before I'm going to give them in. Not that I have money to give anybody, but if I were to have money to give somebody, that's what I would, I would look for. Yeah, and I guess I'm just also looking, like I'm sort of from a marketing um, and idea background, so, and, and then the concept is something that's, uh, you know, close to my heart, say. Um, and I do know people, like, say, in the restaurant who have had their own restaurants, and, yeah, I haven't approached them yet, but I guess I was looking for, yeah, uh, to get their um, their feedback too, on and you know how they could see. But yeah, developing it as good as I can before I present it for sure. Great, thank you. You're welcome. And taking on after that, actually, I would like to talk to you about first experiences of making a sale. 
Mm. So what was your first sale like? So I have two first sales, if that makes sense. Um, I have my retail sales, like when I went to my customer and, and got a sale there, and then I have my consumer sale. Okay. So consumer sale, I've already told you about the trade show, that was my first sale, and we had those lineups of people, which was great. So my retail sale, um, I kind of came onto it by fluke again, which is just pure luck. So there was this local celebrity chef in Kitchener, his name is Chef D, and um, he invited me to be on his show. He saw my product at this trade show, actually, and he invited me to be on his, his cooking show that he has. So I was on his show, it was in Kitchener, and um, the cooking segment was all about grilling and barbecuing and all different types of meats and this and that, so he was using my products on air. Then he interviewed me on there as well. And the latter part of the segment was, um, was someone from, um, I think it was Boyle King or a barbecue company, Weber or Boyle King. And they were just demonstrating, like they're going all through the features and benefits of different barbecues and what to look for in a barbecue and that type of thing. So of course, light bulb went on my head as I'm watching this guy. I thought, oh, I wonder how, and sorry, I forgot to mention, he worked at this big appliance store in Kitchener called TA Appliance. And they have about five different locations and um, they sell all kinds of barbecues and appliances and whatnot. So I, you know, when I saw him presenting, I thought, oh, I should ask him, you know, how do I get into these stores? So I was talking to him afterwards because when you're recording, when you're on TV and it's not live, there's a lot of downtime in between takes and stuff. So we were just chatting and I asked him, I said, you know, like, how would I get my product into your stores? And he said, well, you have to talk to the buyer that's there. And I said, oh, that's great. Like, how would I get to, you know, meet this buyer? And he said, well, I can introduce you if you want. So I said, sure. And in my mind, I was thinking, could we go like right away after this show, you know, after the show? <laughs> but I knew that was going to happen. So, and he was in Kitchener. I was actually living with my parents at the time in St. Thomas, Ontario, so like an hour away. So I said, well, I can come back in town a couple days or next week if you want. And he says to me, he says, you know, well, since you're in town right now, why don't you just follow me back to the store after? So I did. And I had a couple of cases in my trunk. I always carry samples in my car. So I had a couple of cases in my trunk. And um, he introduced me to the buyer, and then it turned out that the owner of the company, the owner of um, uh, Royal King, and uh, also this appliance store, uh, he happened to be there. So I pulled out all these samples and literally gave every single staff member a sample. And they, they looked at the product, and they had never heard of it before, obviously, so they said, yeah, we'll take it. And I remember um, they gave me an order, it was a $10,000 order, and I literally like, called my husband up. I couldn't even talk. I was crying all the way because I was so excited because I thought, oh my God, this is like my very, very first sale. You know, it was just such a, a nice feeling. I photocopied the check and I got pictures of me holding this check and everything, you know, <laughs> like it was just a really nice feeling because it's just that all that hard work. That's when you kind of realize, oh my goodness, there's actually, you know, a customer here that wants my product. And it was just, and I gave that customer so much, like amazing service. I was there almost every week taking pictures and stuff. And, you know, like pointing a finger at my product. <laughs> you know, it was just, it was a really nice feeling. Wow, that's, that's such a nice story. Yeah, it was, it was, I still remember it like it was yesterday. It was such a wonderful <laughs> feeling. Yeah, and, and seeing now, going from that point, when was that? That was, oh my gosh, four and a half years ago. And now we're in about 2,000 stores across the country. We are just getting into the U.S. Um, we're on Amazon.com, Walmart.com now. And we're just onboarding a couple of U.S. customers now as well. So it's starting to, it's still not where I want it to be, but I mean, it's, it's definitely growing for sure. Yeah, so it's that was exciting. actually, that's great because I was just about to lead right into that. You've been telling me about your expansion plans in the States and some things have been going on and cooking mm -hmm. up there. Uh, so tell us about that. So the U.S. is um, a bit of a different market, so it's really hard to get into the U.S. that I'm learning very quickly. Um, I'm fortunate because I have two really, really amazing sales guys, one on the West Coast, one on the East Coast that are in the States. And they have as much passion for this brand that I do. Like, I, I can't even believe I was so lucky to find these guys. And again, it was through networking that I found them um, because I have a, a friend here that works with them directly in the U.S., so that's kind of how you know, I approach them. And, um, I wanted to get on Amazon and I was trying to get on Amazon, but Amazon's kind of a different beast altogether. Unless you actually have connections in there, it's really hard to get in there. This particular person actually specializes. All he does is lives and breathes Amazon. So I was able to get into Amazon with him and our sales just started skyrocketing. Within three weeks, we had um, the Amazon's Choice Badge and the Best Seller Badge on our barbecue sheets and our oven liners. So it's been doing really well in there. But that's kind of how we're starting to get in. And, and also um, a lot of cold calling, like sending. We basically have a strategy where I just send a kit to the, I'll look on LinkedIn and look at their buy, the buyer's information. Because these buyers, they, if you call them up, they'll just ignore your phone calls. They won't return your phone calls. They won't return your emails, nothing. It's, it's a real challenge to get in front of these, these buyers for sure. So you kind of have to get creative. And so my way of doing it is either networking or 
um, going onto LinkedIn, trying to search the buyer's name, and then sending them out a package that they can't resist calling me back. So it's got to be creative. It catches their eye. And they're kind of almost obligated to come out and say thank you to you at least. Then you kind of <laughs> grab their attention. That's kind of what I use for my strategy. But sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> you do love strategy. <laughs> yeah, I know I do. It's very clear. Um, okay, so scaling from the, the first store, that first $10,000 partnership, uh, to 2,000 stores in, the, in Canada and now in, on Amazon and in the States. What are some scaling lessons and business um, growth and expansion lessons that you've learned that you could share with this room today? Uh, the one thing I learned was that, uh, so let me step back for a second. When I was writing my business plans and my first year of my business plans, I thought, oh, we're going to get into like 10 major retailers across the country, like Sobeys, Loblaws, this, that, that didn't happen. So it's, it's really, one, lesson, one big lesson I learned is it doesn't happen overnight. It's being patient. And I know every entrepreneur, I can guarantee you probably all think that when you have this product or service, you want to start making money right away and you want it to happen tomorrow. It's not going to happen tomorrow um, unless it goes viral and someone you know, picks it up. But nine times out of 10, that's not going to happen. So it's really about being patient. And um, that's a big, big thing and persevering and not giving up. That's the one thing I find because you're going to go through rejection after rejection after rejection. That I can guarantee you. And it's a matter of, you know, when you get to that wall, it's either you have two choices. You can walk away from it and just give up your business or you can push through that wall, climb over it, do whatever you have to do to get through that wall. And for me, I wasn't giving up. Like I knew I had a really good product and there was nothing that was going to take me away from that. And there are people, of course, some of my friends would kind of put me in check and say, you know, like, at what point do you think that you might, you know, give up? And I said, I'm never giving up. Like, I'll die trying. I'm not going to give up. And, uh, and I didn't. And I just kept persevering. Because the thing with this product line was that there was no other category that existed. It was first to market. No one had heard of this thing. So a lot of retailers were scared to take that risk. Mm -hmm. And um, Sobeys was one of the first ones, aside from TA Appliance. Sobeys was, was the first ones that gave us a chance. And I was so grateful to them. Now, it did okay in Sobeys, but again, we didn't have any money to put towards advertising or anything like that. And um, at that time, when we first started, because I was doing everything myself, I kind of came late to the party when it came to social media. So I didn't start my social media till later. And now I'm happy to say we're going to be back in Sobeys um, in the spring as well. But um, yeah, I would say like, you know, basically being really persevering, being patient, and knowing how to handle rejection as well. Like that's, that's a big, big, big thing. And if you have thick skin, and you can just pick up the pieces and move on, you know, that's what you need to do. And there's going to be days where we all feel a little isolated or you, you go through a time where, you know, you have a bad day. Everybody has bad days. Um, I'll give you an example. We had this huge customer that we pitched to back in February. And honestly, if I had got this customer, it would have completely changed my life financially. Like it would have overnight, it would have changed everything for me. And he gave us an indication that he was going to accept our product. So I was so excited, like so, so excited, and it didn't happen. And when I got that email that we got turned down, I can tell you, I literally, I was crying. Like I, my husband was trying to call me, and I was just texting him saying we didn't get in. And he's trying to call me at work, and, and my husband's a chiropractor, so he was really busy, so he took his time out of his schedule to call me. And I couldn't even talk. I said, I can't talk right now. I just, just need my space. I just can't talk. And I took that time that I needed. I took like three hours to myself and got my emotions out and then I moved on. I said, okay, you know what, that's okay. One door closes and one opens. And I will get into that customer one day. It might be five years from now, it'll be 10 years from now, whatever it's gonna be. But you have to have that mentality where take the time to be sad, be upset, be angry, whatever, but then move on. You know, don't dwell on it, don't focus on it, just keep, keep going forward. Yeah, that, that experience of falling down and then mm. you know, still needing to move forward because up, you yeah. love your idea and you're, you're so committed to it. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So at what point, like how do you know that an idea is worth going forward with and it's not something that you're going to give up on? I think um, the best thing is to make sure you have a consumer insight and there's a demand for your idea because there's, everybody has ideas. There's so many great ideas out there. And there's also, let's be honest, there's lots of bad ideas out there too. We've seen them in market and, you know, like there's an idea or a concept that I've seen and there, people sometimes create products for the sake of creating a product and there's no real need for it. And those ideas, like those products won't last very long. A lot of them are like those infomercially type of things where they're very gimmicky and stuff. But if you have a demand for your product and it's based on a true consumer insight, um, I think, you know, you should just keep pushing forward and, and ask your fa friends and family. Because like in my case, we didn't have money to do any formal focus group testing or any kind of um, what we call CLT testing where consumers test in their homes. 
So I reached out to all my friends and family and I told them, keep this very, very private, but you know, I got them to test it in their homes. I had this little document made up, um, you know, all these questions I had, I wanted them to answer and I said, be very, very honest with me. And they, every single one of them loved it. And what happened was they would cook on it and friends would come over and people would be asking them, where'd you get this product? And they couldn't tell them, but everybody was, the, the response from their friends was amazing. I, I had this one friend who's a teacher and uh, one of my very dear friends and I gave her, she loves to cook. And so I gave her all my products and um, she had some friends that were over and they were like asking her, where'd you get this? We want to buy this. And when it came to market, she asked me, she, well, before we actually were in stores, she asked me if, if she could sell a few of them for me because some of her friends wanted them at school. And I said, yeah, no problem. I'll drop some off for you. How many do you need? She goes, I just need two. By the end of the day, she had an order for 40 of these barbecue grilling sheets because people just kept telling other people about it and they just loved it. You know, so it's, it's just, you have to have that key consumer insight to know, you know, that there's going to be a demand for the product. There has to be something that you're fulfilling for the consumer. Yeah, so for the people that may not know, what exactly is consumer insight? So a consumer insight is a need that you're filling. So in my case, the example is um, what I realized as soon as I saw this product, immediately I saw nothing sticks, easy cleanup, right? So let me ask you, how many of you, you know, cook or don't cook, but just hate doing dishes? Who loves to do dishes? Let me just put it that way. See, nobody. That's like me. I'm the first person <laughs> to say, I hate doing dishes. So if you don't like to do dishes, this is the product for you because literally nothing sticks to it. So you know, we've all been there when you're making a lasagna or any type of casserole and what happens? The cheese sticks to the corner, you gotta soak your pan overnight, you have to scrub it with you know, all this elbow grease the next day. And with this, we have a casserole liner. If it's like a glove in your casserole dish, the cheese, melted cheese doesn't even stick and your pan underneath is so clean, you can literally just put it away, just rinse it off and put it away. You know, so that was based on that need. So it's basically fulfilling a need that's missing from the marketplace and making sure there's a demand for it. And when there is, a they kind of go hand in hand. When there's a need that's not, that's not met, there's always going to be a demand for that product. Interesting, yeah. Um, okay, so somebody already asked a question about Dragon's Den. Yep. But I wanted to give you the floor to share that story a little bit more. If you wanted to dig a little bit deeper, I think that would be really great. Okay, so um, as you know, we were on Dragon's Den. Um, we got three offers, and uh, it was with, if, if you watch Dragon's Den, um, there is Mike Weckerly, Manjeet Minhas, and Dr Jim, I forget his last name, is it Tra Traveling? Or Tra I can't pronounce his last name, okay. Traveling, I think it is. So those are three offers that we got. And honestly, I, I honestly went on there for the experience um, and to get awareness. That's what I was really going after. I really didn't want a partner, but I never thought about what if I get an offer. I was hoping I'd get an offer, as everybody does, but I, I didn't think, well, what would I do if I got an offer? So when I got three offers, I, I was just, I stood there. Like, this was edited out, but I just kind of stood there and I said, okay, can I just have a minute to think about this? So I had to go back and take my minute. They didn't show this on air, but then I went back and, and asked them if they would, if Jim and, and Manjeet would partner. And uh, they said yes. And then we had several meetings afterwards in person and conference calls. And I just realized that, you know what, I wasn't ready to give up my equity in my business. And I knew that although they could probably help me very much financially, um, and probably with their connections as well, obviously, I just felt this is something that I want to do on my own. And so I decided to decline their offers. So for those of the people here that didn't watch the episode, how much were you offered? Oh, I was offered, um, oh my gosh, I can't remember now, $200,000 for 25%, that's what it was. Okay. Yep. Incredible. All right. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. You're um, I think I'll take another couple minutes to open up the floor once more for questions. Right here. Do we have somebody? I guess it's going to be me. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Just Lauren? Can you help with the mic? Hi. Uh, great presentation, Kalpana and well, Supiti. I appreciate your questions. They're actually very good. Thank um, you. Something that I was wondering, how did you, where did you start developing the product, the, the liners or whatever? Like, how did you, where did you, oh. like, whose door did you <laughs> knock on? How do you, so, that must, to me, is like the So the initial development phase, you mean? Like creating it? Yeah, creating the liner. How do you? Yeah, so when I saw that lady making, like I said, the, the chicken skewers, right away I knew I'd do a bigger version for barbecue, obviously, but, um, but that's where my passion for cooking comes in. And I feel very, very blessed because I honestly have this true passion for cooking from when I was a very, just a little kid. I used to cook with my parents all the time. And so for me, it was taking my passion for cooking and marrying it up with my passion for marketing and kind of bringing the two together. So for me, I kept thinking of, oh, I could use this. When I use this in the barbecue, 
then I thought, oh my gosh, I could do a different version and use it in my loaf liners because I'm always baking and I'm always making banana breads and lemon loaves and all this kind of stuff. And so I, I started making, I started taking just regular paper and cutting out little blueprints and, you know, kind of putting them inside the loaf pans just to kind of get the shape and stuff. And then I'd send them over to the factory and um, get them to make molds of them and stuff to get them to cut exactly. I send my pans over there, my sheets over there to get them to develop so they fit the pans like a glove. And then I started thinking, oh, well, casserole dishes, like, oh, oven liners, like, the, the, you know, the light bulb just, I still have other innovation in the pipeline in my back pocket as well, which I can't tell today, but, um, and that's another thing that's really important. If you do launch a product, it's always important to have a pipeline of innovation in your back pocket because, you know, consumers and um, customers are always looking for the next big thing. Mm -hmm. That was my passion that basically helped What's me develop it. What's the liner made out of? It's made of, um, the actual liner is made of fabric, and then it's covered with, it's like a food fire safe fabric, and um, it's covered with what we call Japanese PTFE. I'm just going to open one so you guys can see it. This is the barbecue one. And it's a flexible liner, and it's, we use Japanese materials because they're 100% non-toxic. There's no PFOA chemicals in them, there's no plastics, BPA, nothing like that. So this is the barbecue one, it goes right on your barbecue. So this goes right on your grill, and you can do anything, like chicken, fish, veggies, um, paneer, like whatever you want, cheese, pancakes, pizzas, and nothing sticks. And literally, you just wipe it off and then reuse it, and it's guaranteed for five years. It's reversible. There's no right or wrong side. It's heat resistant to 500 degrees, and it's non-toxic. That's the best part. And also, obviously, it's good for the environment, too. So they're, they're honestly amazing products. Oh, one thing I forgot to mention, yes, in my first year, I just have to say this because I'm very proud of this. So my first year, we actually won two Product of the Year awards in Canada. And so if you're not familiar with that award, just to go back to my marketing days for a second, um, we used to try and get one of those Product of the Year awards every year, every time marketing that, that the award submission would come in and we'd all get ready to submit our awards or submit our submissions. And we never, ever won. We always, you know, sometimes we'd come close and maybe make a final, be a finalist. But we actually won two, and we're competing against big companies like Kraft and Tostitos and, you know, huge, huge corporations. So we won two Product of the Year awards, and so we were actually, because of that, they put us on City Line on, um, um, was it City Line Breakfast Television, Chatelaine Magazine, we got lots of exposure out of it. And then we also went on to win four more awards um, a couple years later. Interesting. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, Thank you. We can actually pass that yeah, around if you'd like. Sure. Um, just take a look and pass it forward so people get a feel for it. Kalpana, thank you so much for that inspiring story. It's uh, it's one of a unique kind of product, and uh, mm. we loved. It's oh, basically a you. marrying of your passion and your skills. So amazing. I come from an engineering background, I, and finance was my passion. So I changed my. Uh, my career a couple of years back. And I'm seeing that uh, in finance, mostly it's done more traditional way. And uh, I'm not comfortable doing that. I I'm looking for more social media outlook. And I'm just having challenges because basically I don't have any marketing skill except a passion. So what would you suggest for somebody like me where financial services is a more of a very kind of, you know, uh, outspread thing, like mm -hmm. everybody does it, everybody knows it. But I want to specialize in something, at the same time market in a way that is more productive and it's one man show, so you understand the challenge. Exactly, yeah. Is. So, yeah, so this, is like, this is like personal investments, things like that? Is that yes. just so I'm clear? Okay. Yeah, again, I would say um, really leverage social media and make it fun for people because um, if I can just give you really honest feedback, I think the general population feels finance is more of a drier subject. So really make it fun. So make your exactly. posts really fun and engaging. Um, because that's a big thing with social media is a strategy. It's one thing to post something. There's a strategy to social media. So when you're posting, you want to make sure that your content is really engaging. So I always tell people, think of it as a conversation. So if you're out for dinner with somebody and you're having a conversation, um, if the person's always talking about themselves constantly, you're just going to check out. You're not going to be engaged. You're going to be disengaged, right? Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure with your content, it's always engaging. And you want to sort of subtly you know, bring your your services into place, but you could, you know, maybe look online and see if there's any funny sort of jokes that are related to finance, because people tend to share those kinds of things more, and then you can, you know, and just at the end of it say, oh, for your personal finance needs, and, and, and put your business on there. Like, for example, with us, um, with our social media, the one thing I'm very adamant about with the people that do my social media is I always tell them, don't talk about us every single time, because I, I just think people will be disengaged. So we do a lot of recipes and tips, and we ask questions and things like that, 
And then we also, don't get me wrong, it's all about branding and driving awareness. So we also subtly will say, oh, like for example, we had a, a casserole um, recipe the other day. At the end of it, we'll say, oh, and by the way, don't forget to pick up your casserole liner to make sure it's easy cleanup, that type of thing. So just do it subtly, but um, make it really fun. If you can find a way to make financial services fun, and I, I can think of some ideas, but just you know, try and make it fun because people will respond to that. People love memes. They love like you know humor. You know we don't see a lot of humor out there these days. You know as much. So I would recommend doing something like that. Yes. And again, following other services, financial services that you think are doing a great job and have huge following. See what they're doing. Maybe give away another contest. Like you could do you know um, like a free um, consultation, that type of thing. Free free personal analysis, things like that. Uh, I know, but as you said, it's very dry. Dry and like people don't like to go through those uh, numbers and all those things. So if I were to look something into contest, what would be your suggestion? Except uh, analysis or something like that. You could do even gift certificates. Mm -hmm. People love gift certificates, and I'm telling you, on social media, you don't have to have anything big. People do like T-shirts, hats, things like that, even. But I would I would give stuff away that's. You want to always bring it back to your business, but if you can do a gift certificate plus maybe um, one of your services, like it could be a free analysis, something like that. Mm -hmm. But contests are always, always really big. And then again, leveraging if there's someone that you know that is doing well on social media, has a good following, and can relate to your product, so it can kind of you can kind of partner with them. You know, that will be something as well. Like, do you do mortgages and things like that as well, or is it more just personal? I, I do mortgages, but I'm trying to focus more on the uh, insurance side. So okay. And, I'm trying to establish a niche and uh, serving small business owners. Exactly. That's what I'm trying so to do. It's kind of another thing you could do. So I just had this idea. Would um, just in reference to your in relation to your content, you could um, you know post tips on, you know, for example, it could be different things. Like one example could be you know how to how to budget for you know whatever whatever the item is. I can't can't think of it on top of my head, but just. You know, give them tips on how to save for a, the vacation of their dreams, or you know, by, by these three easy steps or these ten easy steps. So have like a newsletter format, and then that way it'll direct people to. If you have a website on your social media, direct them to that. You know, you can give away gift certificates, you know, all that kind of stuff. But um, just make sure your content is really, really relevant. That's the way you're going to get engagement: is relevant content. Incredible. Thank you so much. In the interest of time, I'm going to move on. Yep. Um, and Kalpana will be around to answer more questions if you've got more at the end, for sure. Um, but I was wondering, so you were talking a little bit about branding while an answering yep. her question. And that kind of made me think a little bit about your products say Unstick by Dokken. Oh. <laughs> and I was curious, because I've, I've heard Unstick a lot, but what is by Dokken? So this is something that's very sentimental to me, and I don't want to get emotional, but um, so Dawkin is a combination of my married name, which is Doggerty, and Kundra, which is my maiden name. And my parents have been the most influential people in my life from obviously when I was born, but especially the past few years, they've just been really supportive with my business, um, both my parents. And I just wanted to make sure, they're a lot older now too, so I really wanted to make sure that I carried that legacy on with me. And one of my bigger reasons for doing this product line, aside from eventually making it into a household brand name, that's my ultimate goal, is to really be able to give back. Uh, my parents came to this country many, many years ago, and you know they had, I think my dad came first, and he had $40. As you know, you're allowed to bring $40 into the country at the time, and he had $80, that he snuck in an extra 40, you know, and he thought he was gonna get in trouble for doing that. And um, so when he came to the country, um, you know, they built a really good life for us and for, the, you know, for all of us and they always stressed education and they always gave back. They were just, they didn't have a lot and we didn't have a lot growing up, but the one thing they always did was they gave back to the community and overseas. And I didn't even know half the stuff they did until years after the fact when I found out that they would break, like in India, they, a lot of people have servants over there. And so, and these servants live with them for many years with the families over there. And so they would like break the cycle for these servants because typically what happens is someone's a servant, their kids become servants and so on and so forth for generations. And they would literally, they didn't want that. So they would break the cycle and they would um, you know, make sure that those servants' kids went to university and got an education paid for for my parents. And they always did it anonymously and they've been doing it for like something like 50 years now. And so for me, a big reason of doing this business is that eventually my plan is, my ultimate goal is to be able to give back, to be able to start a foundation in their name and to be able to, um, it's going to be education driven. I'm not sure what that's going to be yet, if it's going to be opening schools abroad or you know, what that looks like, but that's why I have it on there is because I really want to make sure that you know, they get credit for, for supporting me all these years. And if, I, if they haven't taught me how to cook when I was younger, I wouldn't have had that passion in me either. 
Wow, it all really does tie back, eh? Mm -hmm. yeah. It does for sure. Yeah, well, I'm excited for Dawkins to become an everyday household name. So am I. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, so if going back, if you had to do all of it again, if you had to restart your company, go through all of this experience again, what would you do differently? Or is there something you would do differently? You know, aside from discovering the material 10 years earlier, or you know, having more money to be able to support the brand more, mm. I honestly don't think I'd change a thing. And the reason I say that is because the mistakes you make along the way is what just makes you grow. You know what I mean as an entrepreneur? Like, you can't fail, you can't succeed without failure. You know, you just can't. Like, you have to make those mistakes along the way. If you don't make mistakes, I don't know, you're just not a, I just feel you just have to make those mistakes to get to where you are today. Mm -hmm. So is I don't think I'd change anything. Okay, got it. And is there a mistake that in particular really like changed something for you, moved you forward? Um, I mean, I made a lot of mistakes along the way, but um, nothing really huge. I think the biggest mistake I made was when I first started, and I know better too, so there's something on the back of every product everybody's familiar with called the UPC. And in my, like a lot of people don't realize this, this UPC has to pass this thing called a scan certificate. And I know this from my corporate background, but if you don't have a corporate background, you may not know this, so you know, be kind of an easy mistake to make. And in my case, I should have known better. And so what happened was I was really rushed because I was trying to get this product for my first trade show, my first shipment. And I had done all the scan certificates, like everything that I was supposed to do. And in the end, um, what I didn't do was I didn't get an actual sample from China to come to the company here to actually scan it physically. I just had them do my scan certificate. So when I got this huge shipment, my first shipment of $10,000 of the products, and it wouldn't scan. So, you know, what am I gonna do with this stuff? So, so I had to um, be creative, and I actually ended up using it in all my trade shows um, and had to order more product, but that was a big mistake. And it was one of those things where I should have, I shouldn't have just, I was just trying to get it out, you know, get, get here as quick as possible. Yeah. And I kind of skipped that step thinking it would be okay, and I learned the hard way it wasn't. But the other mistakes I made were more just smaller mistakes, you know, but nothing really huge. Yeah, no, that's a really great share. Thank you. Uh, it also speaks a lot about how do you turn adversity and some of the, the huge challenges that come your way as an entrepreneur into mm -hmm. more of an opportunity, which is what you did with the trade shows. Yeah. Uh, so the last question of the night before we break into the problem solving rounds is what is next for you and what is next for Unstick? Next for me is really just growing the brand, um, driving awareness. That's a big, big, big thing for us. Um, you know, even though we're in still about 2,000 stores, um, there is now, you probably see in Costco and other places, there's um, a copycat out there now with my, my barbecue sheets. So um, there's actually, if you go on Amazon, there's probably about 50 copycats out there now too. So, I mean, what makes us different though is we have a premium product. Um, ours is the only one that's 100% PFOA free and it's, you know, it's, it's non-toxic. So the other products that you see out there, they're made with cheaper materials, they have some toxic chemicals in them. Um, obviously they don't advertise that on their packs. So, you know, it's really driving that point of difference with retailers, with consumers, increasing our following on social media. So please follow me if you haven't already. Um, I wouldn't be a true marketer if I didn't give myself a shout out. So um, that's, you know, just really growing the brand. And eventually the plan is that hopefully in 10 years from now, if not sooner, um, we'll have way more increased distribution. It'll be a household name. And having the money to actually properly advertise, because right now it's just, we're still being really creative and just using social media, which is great, but it'd be nice to, to do a lot of in-store advertising and, and do a lot more things out there and really take my marketing learnings and, and be able to run with them. Yeah, amazing. Well, we're all very, very excited to see you do thank those you. huge things, climb those big mountains. And at this point, I would like to thank you very, very much. Can we please give Kulpna a huge round of applause? Thank you.